Hello, everybody. Welcome to our webinar uh, titled Fast Track Your Application Refactoring to Microservices on AWS. Uh, my name is Belinda Quick. I'm a principal product manager here with AWS Migration Services. And I have the pleasure of being joined today by Amir Rapson, who is our chief technology officer of one of our partners, V Function. Uh, <laughs> Maybe not it for you. Um, just so we can get through our demo, we're going to go off of our video here and share some uh, slides at the beginning, and then we're going to actually jump in and show you a live demo of how V Function ends up integrating with um, our refactor spaces on AWS. So I'm going to stop my sharing here, and I'm going to move into our uh, conversation on refactor spaces first, and then we'll get to V Function second. <clears throat> So we launched uh, AWS Migration Hub Refactor Spaces in February of this year. When we launch a service at AWS, we, we usually take our key, keys and our notes from our customers. And after a period of time working with our customers, we had identified a common pattern where they had asked about refactoring on AWS and how could they make it faster. There's a lot of undifferentiated heavy lifting that goes into preparing the right environments so that you can move from an application architecture that may be a monolith over to some more modern compute platforms like microservices uh, such as serverless or containers. With our uh, new service, Refactor Spaces, we've worked so that you can combine your legacy application and your microservices into a single application, and you can start that refactoring in app your, of your application in days instead of months. I'd like to take pause on this slide just because I think this is one of the coolest icons on the AWS console. Yes, I'm biased too. Um, but this, cons uh, this icon represents the strangler fig tree. If you're not aware of what the strangler fig tree, um, it was <clears throat> brought uh, forward by Martin Fowler of ThoughtWorks to describe the pattern and process of taking pieces of an existing application and peeling it off as you modernize it or as you refactor it into a new architecture for that application. Um, as we look at refactoring to microservices, we'd like to take pause and make sure that we're aligning to the right value propositions for refactoring. We know that when you move to microservices, you'll be reducing your deployment blast radius. Within AWS, we know that security is job one, and we know that the management of accounts and the management of your workloads on AWS needs to make sure it's supporting a reduced blast radius to take full advantage of the cloud capabilities and cloud scale. When we look at the next benefit of microservices, when you're looking at things that are moving into a single deployable instance, you're really creating functional autonomy and that single responsibility model. No longer do you have a large application that has a broad range of services and capabilities tightly coupled in a monolith instance. When you get to that, those microservices, you're able to operate with functional autonomy and single responsibility. This then gets you that benefit of being able to increase your deployment velocity. What we mean by that is you have your teams aligned so that you can directly deploy on those single responsibility functions. And of course, with the cloud capabilities, you are then able to focus your scalability as well. I like to give the example of an e-commerce platform. And as we know, in e-commerce capabilities, the catalog is often traversed at a higher frequency than maybe the cart and then maybe even the checkout still. If you're able to focus the scalability, create your, your services and features around that catalog that is separate from what you're doing with your checkout, you're not, you're not over installing instances and you're not under installing them as well. You're able to focus that scalability to meet the specific demands of your customers. When we talk about refactoring on AWS, especially with refactor spaces, we talk about two primary patterns. We talk about the leave and layer pattern and the use of the strangler fig pattern. Again, the coolest, uh, icon on the console. But with leave and layer, this gives you an, a different alternative to, as a starting point alongside your monolith. We often talk about the law of holes, and you don't want to keep uh, digging if you find yourself in a hole. If you find yourself with a monolith that has tight coupling or a large cent set of enterprise dependencies, uh, you may want to reduce that by creating a new feature set and leave it and layer it next to your monolithic application. 
or you may choose to refactor it incrementally. That's where the Strangler Fig pattern comes in. You're able to create the, the team independence with a modern application architecture because you're peeling off different feature sets into new services, and you're able to redirect from that old to the new in an incremental fashion until the point in time you're ready to turn off that old code and reduce that, that legacy technical debt that you may be incurring. When we talk about Migration Hub Refactor Spaces and when we introduced it, we really wanted to position a product to help you reduce the time to set up and manage your refactor environments, give you the opportunity to do that at production scale so that you can shield your application consumers from any changes that you're making while you're refactoring that application, and give you the opportunity to reroute that traffic from the old to the new across multiple AWS accounts. The multiple AWS accounts really helps achieve that reduced blast radius. We know in AWS that different accounts are used to isolate workloads, and this allows you to route traffic across those isolated workloads in distinct accounts as well. And with this service, you're able to start refactoring in days instead of months. So what, how do we do it? Well, we're orchestrating services under the covers. We are orchestrating and setting up a transit gateway and associating it to VPCs to bridge your networking across your accounts and simplify that communication between the old and the new services. We're creating that network fabric for you. We're using an API gateway so that the external access to your new services is shielded and any of those incremental changes are shielded from the application consumers as you're making those changes to incrementally route that traffic from old to new. We're also looking at resource sharing across those multiple accounts. Behind the scenes, we're using resource access managers so that you can share your constructs and that network fabric is ready to go so that you can start using your applications quickly. So how does this work? When you start, start with refactor spaces, you're gonna create a, a refactor space initially. We recommend you do this in a distinct account that's dedicated for your refactor spaces. In here, you're gonna be using and we're gonna be provisioning a transit gateway. This transit gateway can peer to other network fabrics you may already have in your enterprise footprint, or it may be a standalone just specific for this application. You're gonna identify accounts that you want to associate to the environment. In this example, you may already have lifted and shifted your monolithic application to AWS. You may already have a monolith instance sitting inside a VPC in a distinct account on AWS. You're then gonna create a new account for your microservices thereafter. You're gonna create an application proxy, and in this, we have set up API Gateway ready to go for you and orchestrated that for you. And you're then gonna start creating the services that you are gonna use to route the traffic and your new service endpoints. Here, you can see we've got traffic and services included with your VPC. We're hooking into that network fabric that we've orchestrated for you, and we're associating that across your accounts. Then you merely just need to add the, add the routes to the accounts, and then you're ready to go. And the example for the commerce application I provided previously, you may choose to leave your catalog to sit within the monolith because it's tightly coupled to other pricing instances or other types of capabilities inside that monolith, but you may choose to move your checkout or your cart capabilities over to those new microservices. In this example, you would simply route your slash cart to the new microservice where your slash commerce application would be routing primarily to the monolith. Apologies. Uh, Refactor Spaces launched available in 10 regions um, across the globe. And we also have a small charge for Refactor Spaces. There's an, a, a small amount of pricing. It equates to 2.8 cents per environment hour. For the hours that you're using that Refactor Spaces environment, we do charge a, a small fee. It turns into a, approximately $20 per month per environment if you run it continuously for that month. You do have a free three months to evaluate um, up to three Refactor environments and do your POCs and understand the values that uh, Refactor Spaces brings to the table by uh, taking off that undifferentiated heavy lifting so that you can begin refactoring your applications. We also charge for API requests directly to Refactor Spaces. Those API requests are uh, 
you have 500,000 free of them, and then it's a very small percentage of a um, cent per request thereafter. So about a million requests costs about $2. And again, those are API requests to refactor spaces, not the API requests to your monolith or your other application. In addition to the refactor spaces charges, you do incur charges for any of the other services that we provision, as well as the services that you're using to uh, create your monolith or your new microservice. So when you get started with Refactor Spaces, you're able to quickly set up your infrastructure, operate your applications at scale, and focus on delivering that value from refactoring without having to recreate uh, the initial environment to manage that change. In the next uh, section here, Amir is going to walk you through a demo of how he has used Refactor Spaces with um, a capability that vFunction brings forward to help you automate the refactoring of an application. I'm going to quickly uh, go over how that demo has been pre-set up for refactor spaces so you can understand how you can create an environment and application and use that to get started with your refactoring. The first thing you're going to do is to set up your refactor spaces environment. In this example, we'll have a workshop OMS as the name of the environment that we'll set up. And it's going to be an order management system as the example. After that, you're going to create an application, and this, the application is specifically that order management system, and we're going to define which VPC it's sitting in so that you can create that VPC as you create that application associated to your environment. The next step you're going to do is you're going to review it to make sure everything you've created is correct. And then you're going to set up your service endpoints. In this example, you're going to have an order controller. You're going to have a health check endpoint for that order controller. And then you're going to start routing traffic to that service. The slash order is going to go to that new service endpoint as opposed to the existing monolith default route that you also created. You're creating this route here in order to make sure that the traffic is moved over to that new microservice instead of being routed to the monolith. And you're going to review your refactor spaces environment with the services and routes. You can see, see here on the console page, I've navigated to the services and routes section, and you can see that we are checking the health status of it, and that order controller is there, as well as that monolith service already existing for the system. That's the high level of what we do with Refactor Spaces. And let me turn it over to Amir now, and he can walk us through how Refactor Spaces integrates with B function. I am going to make Amir the presenter. Amir, it appears that you are a mute. Okay, thank you. Um, hi, yeah. thanks, Belinda. Um, so what I'm going to show you now, I'll tell you a little bit about V function, and I'll do it uh, quickly. Um, if you want more information, uh, then um, uh, more information is available on the V function site. Um, and, uh, and and also the demo and the demo is, is uh, that I'm going to show is part of uh, the AWS V function workshop um, that is also available um, and you can uh, sign up for it through our site um, and it will help you kind of take this fixed strangler pattern and uh, and bring it to life very quickly with these two tools with V function and with uh, Refactor Spaces. So without further ado, um, I want to talk a little bit about why we want to uh, re-architect applications and why we want to uh, extract services from them. So the, the main reason to do this is really from an engineering standpoint. Uh, with time, you accumulate a lot of technical debt in software, in software applications. Um, and that technical debt means that you have long test cycles, long release cycles, you're really unable to meet the business requirements. It's hard to ramp up new developers because of the growing technical debt and growing legacy. Uh, and there's a, a, eventually poor customer and user experience. And this causes you to want to modernize the application by refactoring it or re-architecting it, reducing the amount of technical debt and restoring your engineering velocity. 
So what is V function? So V function is a platform for developers and architects that uses AI um, automatically to assess, analyze, design and extract services. So design like a microservices architecture out of a monolithic application. Um, it then helps you to transform and modernize these applications. So take it from a monolith to mini services or microservices. Uh, to refactor the application and increase the modularity and reduce the technical debt, the architectural technical debt, to continuously modernize the application and also to remove debt code from the application. And because it's an automated tool that uses AI to do this, you can also employ it in a, in a repeatable and scalable manner inside your organization. So it doesn't, it's not only one huge project that you can undertake, but you can really uh, do this uh, for many applications concurrently. Uh, with vFunction, you can really get to a 20x acceleration in your modernization projects, in your re-architecting projects. The cost reduction uh, that we have seen is about 3x. And the most important factor, in my opinion, is the risk reduction. Usually, modernization uh, projects that mean re-architecting large monolithic applications and splitting them into a microservices architecture is a very risky project that usually fails. Uh, what we see with vFunction is at least a 10 times uh, risk reduction. So we see um, a success rates of well over uh, 80 or 90 percent in these projects when they engage through vFunction uh, where uh, about 80% of the projects fail uh, according to uh, uh, literature. So what can you do with vFunction? So vFunction is, as I said, a platform for with, that uses AI and, and it's like a data-driven uh, platform that helps you make good decisions with regard to the technical debt of the application. So it does have two different uh, tools or two different flavors to it. One is the assessment, which is a decision maker tool that really helps you understand what is that technical debt causing within your application. So it very quickly gives you a, 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 uh, an estimate that for every dollar that you spend on innovation or uh, in developing the application, how much of that dollar actually goes into innovation and how much goes to feed that technical debt or to repay that technical debt. And what we come up with is a number that we call the total cost of ownership or the TCO multiplier. And that means that if, let's say, your business wants to develop a certain feature and you think that that feature should cost you about, let's just say, $10,000 to develop, uh, you actually have your TCO multiplier that because of your, your, your technical debt, it's not 10K, it's rather, in this specific example that we see here on the left, $28,000. Uh, if you first reduce the technical debt or refactor the application, it will help you reduce that TCO multiplier all back to something around one. And this is really how to build a business case to refactor your applications. Uh, it's very hard, you know, without these tools for developers and development, development managers to understand you know, if a certain refactoring project will yield uh, a positive result on the application. Um, because at every time, I mean, we hate the code that we develop, right? And, and after a while, we just want to throw it and rewrite it. But it doesn't mean that um, the effect on the application will be positive at the end of the day. The second part of the application of the B function platform, I mean, that uh, we're going to focus on today is, uh, is the modernization hub, the modernization piece of the application, which is the, the modernization platform where you can really re-architect applications, um, understand what is the microservices architecture that you can achieve, uh, and allow an architect to interact with the system, and that's what we're going to see in a second. Uh, I'll give an example of what you can, can, you can do with this uh, um, platform with many applications. So if you have an assessment with, that shows high level of technical debt, but using the modernization, it shows you a high level of modernization effort. And you can decide, okay, if it's like a, if I get if there's a low technical debt but high refactoring effort, then you need to replatform this application. You don't need to uh, to transform it into microservices. If it's low and low, do whatever you want. 
if it's a high level of technical debt and low refactoring efforts, so according to the V-Function platform, most of it you can do automatically, then you should definitely go ahead and extract many of the services. Or with the V-Function platform, if you see that there's a high level of debt, but also it looks very complex to, to, to uh, extract services, then you can use the V-Function platform to slowly reduce uh, the complexity up until you get to this point here, where you can extract these services with V-Function. So how does V-Function work? Um, well, we start with the assessment. The assessment is uh, doing static analysis on the bytecode of the, the Java application um, or the .NET application. So it's on the binary, on the compiled application. Um, after, after that, go into the modernization hub, which uses both dynamic and static analysis. So the, in the beginning, we do the learning phase. The learning phase, you run tests through an application uh, that has the vFunction agent running on it. So if it's a JVM, then the, the, the uh, vFunction agent is a JVM agent running on the JVM. And it learns everything that happens in the JVM as the application runs. So we track uh, call stacks from running applications uh, from, uh, or from the running threads, and we see everything that's happening. We also track certain objects that might uh, tell our AI what is the domain or um, of a certain flow, or, or rather, if there's two different call stacks, maybe they are related to a certain domain to by just by the fact that they're accessing uh, specific objects. Let's call these objects, like for instance, a database table. But there are also certain constraints that we track. It could be locks or synchronization objects. It could be database transactions. And these constraints can also imply uh, that two different flows better be extracted together. Um, if all this information with the static and the dynamic analysis is sent to the vFunction studio, the, the microservices design studio, which is what I'm going to show you next, um, where the architect uses the vFunction platform to design the services that they want to extract and they're the result of the architecture. Once the architect is happy with uh, the design, with the architecture, the, the architect can then go forward and extract the services with the function, so the extraction is automatic, and then deploy it to the cloud uh, with any uh, service, uh, and then also use refactor spaces to, to uh, use the Strangler Frig approach to start to divert traffic into those services. Okay, I'll move to the demo now. So this is the vFunction console. I'll move to full screen. Uh, what you see in front of us is after the learning. So it's not. Uh, it's after the uh, all the dynamic analysis. We've seen everything, and and here is, is where the architect starts to interact with the system. Uh, what we see in front of us is the architecture view of the system. What you have, all these spheres are represent services. Their size indicates that their size in terms of number of classes, the number of classes that are on the service, the more classes, the larger the sphere. The color indicates the metrics that we calculate for um, the, uh, um, the services. Um, and the key metrics is really the exclusivity or how much the domain exclusivity or how much of the domain is really encapsulated in the service. And we do that by calculating both class exclusivity. So the percentage of classes that according to this architecture will be exclusive to a certain service. And that's what we want to achieve as architects, really, when we do the separation. Uh, but we also want to get to a high resource exclusivity. So it means that most of the domain is encapsulated uh, in a certain service, and there are as little as constraints as possible to extract these services. So green color means high exclusivity, blue is medium exclusivity, and usually with not with demo applications, but with real application, you also see uh, pinkish red services, which means low exclusivity, which means more work for you architects to design it. Uh, these dotted lines here are calls between the services, so anything that's from this black hole in the middle, which is really what remains of the monolith, are going to be endpoints of the distributed system. These are service-to-service -service calls, these dotted lines between those these uh, spheres here. Um, and, and, and immediately we can orient ourselves into what is the best um, architecture of the system. Now, this application that we're analyzing, it's a demo application. It's a very small application. It's a total of 55 classes. 
what it is in is an is an order management system. So it's it mimics like a behavior of a retail application. So we're talking about um, you know orders and inventory and shipping, etc. And and we actually see those names on the right. So these are all found automatically using some heuristics. It could be based on the class of the methods that it, that at least now logically invoke these services. It could be based on a common texture within those classes and methods. Um, and we can, we can look deeper into that. So let's just click on one service. I chose this one. This is the Modify Fulfillment Controller. So you can guess what it does uh, on a retail application. It modifies fulfillment. Um, clicking on the entry points, the entry points are the methods that invoke the service. Uh, we can see the calls, the call tree. We can also hide common classes and third-party classes to really focus on the business flow uh, that's within this call stack and understand what it is actually that we're going to, to considering to extract. We can look at the dynamic classes that were found, so the classes that were found in the dynamic class uh, analysis, and we see that there is 50% exclusivity uh, for these classes. So that means that two of these four classes were found to be exclusive to the service, so that's why it's medium exclusivity. And we can click to see more. So as, a, as we saw before, two classes um, out, of the, of, out of the four are exclusive and two are not exclusive. Um, let's look at this uh, shipping service as an example. Shipping service class, we see that it's used here, but it's also, we can see where else it's used, and we see it's using, used in the shipping price controller. So now as architects, we need to make a decision. What do we want to do? So we can modify the boundaries of the services, so we can modify the boundaries of the modified fulfillment services, so instead of calling the shipping service, it'll actually uh, uh, call an API to the shipping service and not, and not actually call that class. So let's do that. Um, clicking here, to the, the platform will take me to the right place in the code where I, as an architect, can click to make an entry point to the shipping price controller. What it will do, it will logically add an API here. The system will calculate everything in the background, and when I go back to the services, I'll see that this is now turned green. There is, I have an added service-to-service -service call here, um, and now I see that there's instead of four classes, there are three because the shipping uh, class is not there anymore. Um, I'll also show you the, the next class, which is the sales order. The sales order is a class um, that is used in the product controller and the modified fulfillment controller, but it is ba just based on the, um, the package. It's really an entity. So as an architect, I can decide, do you want to change the boundaries by encapsulating uh, API, uh, these entities with APIs? But another option for me at this point is to take all of these entities and put them in a common library. So putting them in a common library that they will be dependencies of all the services that use this, the, the common library uh, will remove this from this non-exclusive, but to actually put them in this infra. So this is going to be the, uh, the common library. So let's do that and mark the package as infra and click submit. Um, Going back to the services, I now get to 100% exclusivity in the Modify Fulfillment Controller, um, uh, and uh, and we can look at um, the rest of the, the the things that the platform shows us. So let's look at the, the resources. Um, so the resources here, we can see all those objects that we mentioned before that we track. So there are exclusive ones and some non-exclusive ones. For instance, some database tables. Let's look at this order line table for, for just as an instance. So this order line table, we would have liked it to be uh, exclusive to the order controller, but if we look uh, through the system where it's called from, it's actually called from the sales order entity that we just decided it's gonna be in a common library. So could have made a different decision to make this encapsulated with an API and, and to add an entry point around here, which would have made this, end, this database table exclusive. Uh, and that just means that as architects, it's not always easy uh, to make these decisions, but at least we know what it means to make these decisions when we're working with a platform like Lee Function. Um, I'll go quickly at some other aspects. So order controller, 100% exclusivity from a dynamic perspective. Let's look at the static analysis here. We see that there's a sales order repository um, 
we can we can look at the static dependencies we see that it appears in both order controller and modify fulfillment controller if we expand that oops sorry we see that the order service calls the order reposit the sales order repositories which is a jpa repository to access the sales order um, and from the modify fulfillment is exactly the same so the modify fulfillment controller accesses the sales order repository to the sales order that is uh, and so okay so there's nothing for us to do at this point with this repository so we can decide to leave it as a non-exclusive class uh, and just proceed um, uh, sorry I was looking at the order controller um, I'll skip ahead I want to show you uh, some more stuff the product controller um, so again, uh, there's an inventory service here, so as a non-exclusive class. So here it's using the inventory controller uh, from the product controller. Let's again add an entry point, exactly as we've done before. So instead of the, so the inventory service from the product service, we're gonna add an, uh, an entry point, and that entry point will lead to the, the inventory controller. And again, we're gonna remove this uh, exclusivity. Now remember this because we're going to extract this uh, product controller in a minute and we do want it to call the inventory controller instead of calling that class. So we will see that how to modify this service to include an API call instead of just calling the repository. Um, last thing I'm going to do, we, there are two blue services that are left here, payment service and diner's payment service. These are obviously similar. I'm just going to merge them together and get to uh, uh, an architecture of the system that I'm happy with. With every change, the system recalculates everything, shows me the feedback, and this is my final architecture. Now let's jump to actually extracting these services. Extracting these services is super easy. I'm gonna take the services that I want to extract uh, with this pattern, uh, strangler freak pattern, just click on plus. So this is the order controller is now uh, candidate for extraction. I'm going to choose the inventory controller and the product controller as well. Um, as soon as I select these, the service creation tab becomes available and I can download um, what we call a service specification file. So these are JSON files that really describe what is required in order for the service to get created. Um, we also create YAML files. The YAML files are open API specifications for all the APIs that are going to be generated by the system. Um, I can just show you one of them, like the order controller. So these are going to these. This is the description of all of these um, of all the APIs that are going to get created with their DTOs. Uh, there's a, a description. There's a, a minimized print configuration that's going to come out with the service. Uh, some other files that are required. Um, these are the classes that are required for the service. These are the dependencies that are needed for the service. We see that there's a um, Spring Data JPA, as an example, is required for this service. So, uh, um, so when when the system will create the service and find these classes and and put them aside, it'll also know to create a POM a POM file or a Gradle script with these um, dependencies already in it. Uh, and we also are going to create Spring Brute application out of this uh, Spring MV, out, out of this um, uh, Spring MVC application running on Tomcat. So currently this OMS is running on Tomcat. So, so at this point I'm going to skip to actually creating these services. So what I have here um, is really, well, I already copied all the spec files into the service spec directory. So you see all the YAMLs and the JSONs here. Uh, I have the sources of the original application under, uh, under OMS web application. Um, and I'm gonna start to create these applications. So there's a code copy utility that comes with the platform. So you download it from the UI. So it's very simple. You just provide it with the JSON file that was extracted, point it to the original sources and, and the destination directory where you want to create this, these services. So you see OMS services doesn't exist. I'm going to create it for the common library. I'm going to create it for the order controller. I'm going to create it for the inventory controller. And I'm going to create it for the product controller. 
and this is it. So we've got our services, and and it's it's very uh, and for now we have manual some manual tweaks that we need to do in order to make it uh, to compile it. So we and and before it was part of a monolithic application. Now it's Spring Boot services. I want to show you here um, all the changes that are part of this application. So that that we performed that that we need to make in order to compile them. So let's see. So let's look at this inventory controller as an example. Um, for the inventory controller, we changed the, we want to take it from a, a Spring data source and move it to a Spring Boot data source. So we took the Spring Boot, the, uh, sorry, the Spring Beans uh, definition to the, the, uh, that described the data source and removed them from this uh, Spring configuration. We added them into the application properties here. Um, we also pointed out that this main application that was created, that we want to do some entity scanning on it and to, enter, to add all the common OMS entities that we put in the directory. And that's it. That's everything we need in order to make this a Spring Boot application. So I'm going to apply these changes. Um, there's also, I, I added the dependency the runtime dependency for the MySQL connector. That is obviously not something that we see um, in the analysis. So that's something that we need to add. So this is the last change in order to compile the, the inventory controller. Same changes are going to be applied to the order controller. And lastly, the, the, the product controller I also modified it slightly uh, because as if you remember, um, if you if you remember, we changed a call uh, from I'll show you in the source a call to from a, a method call to really an API call. So we do need to add all of those DTOs. Um, this is the entity scanning, but for the service, I'll, so I'll show you what the change that we had to do. And this is it. Just take this method that was previously a method call and turn it into an API. Okay, that's it. So um, now I'm going to show you some magic uh, and that is really to compile all these services. So you would agree that it's usually supposed to take a lot more, um, not during a live demo to turn an application into a Spring Boot application, but nonetheless, uh, let's go and do this OMS services. We have all of these directories under common. We're going to do a Maven install. This is all live. I'll do the same for the inventory controller. And I can do the same for the rest. So uh, in just a few minutes, we took an application, we analyzed it, we extracted services from it, we're compiling it now, uh, and, um, and we can, we're ready to deploy them. So these are now Spring Boot applications. They can be deployed on any platform in, in simple containers. So that is something that I did ahead of time. And if we see it here, we can, we can run uh, kubectl. So this is something that I prepared. Uh, get pods in the namespace with V function. So we see that I, uh, I uploaded those three services, inventory controller, order controller, and product controller into the Kubernetes. So now, and, and on this machine, the, the Tomcat is still running. So this is the Tomcat that's running here. Um, so we have the OMS application as a monolith running and the services, and now we want to, sh to use we factor spaces uh, to start diverting traffic to it. So I'm going to jump again to another tab here. Um, and this is the refactor spaces UI. Um, so this is a feature. Just look for refactor spaces um, and it'll show you how to find it. Um, it does have the coolest logo. Uh, it's the only AWS sticker I have on my laptop. Uh, but uh, so um, we we see here the OMS environment that was created, as you've seen in Belinda's screenshots. 
underneath this application was created. Under the application, we defined two services, one which is the order controller, one of the services we extracted, and we pointed it to the EKS environment where it's now running. So it's running on the Kubernetes on an EKS uh, as order controller. This, this is the ingress uh, URL, and this is the name of the controller. Uh, and this is the default application. This is simply pointing to the Tomcat that we've seen just a second ago um, uh, with, for the monolith. And we added two routes. One is a default route. So everything, uh, every API, uh, regardless of the source, if it's not matched by any more specific routes, it's going to go to the OMS monolith. If it starts with order controller, it's going to go to the order controller service, meaning it's going to go to this endpoint right here. And lastly, I'm going to skip to um, this machine here, where I can show you using Postman that it actually works. Um, I'm going to do this, uh, get multiple orders, create multiple orders. So this is an API of the service that we created and deployed on the Kubernetes. And this is the URL of the refactor spaces. I'll send this, you see that it gets to, so I, I can get a response. I can do the same directly to the EKS, I'll get the same response. Um, I can show you uh, if I do uh, create uh, inventory, which is uh, part of the monolith itself. Uh, it's not part of a service right now. I haven't uploaded that service. I haven't defined that service. So I get this response. Or if I do want to do uh, create inventory um, via refactor spaces, then this is the URL, sending it, and I'll get the same response. So, um, so, so, really, so it's working. So now we have a service that was extracted with the strangler fig pattern. Um, and um, I think this is it for the demo. I'll just, yeah, I think I've covered everything I wanted to cover. Uh, um, as I said, everything here is uh, available on the vFunction website with a lot more detail, and you can uh, get in touch with us, and we can show you this workshop and how to work both with vFunction and with uh, Refactor Spaces. Uh, in order to modernize your application by extracting it or re-architecting it. Um, I think this is a good time for a polling question. And I'll move, uh, I'll share the presenter. Um, Belinda, the, I'll move the screen back to you. Yeah, so Jan, if you wanna share our last um, poll, or our first and last poll of the day uh, with the uh, folks on the call here, I'll uh, jump over and take my, um, Screen share as soon as that poll is done. The organize uh, and Jan, when you're ready to close it, I'll go ahead and take over the um, screen share as soon as the poll is closed. While we're waiting for the poll to close, uh, Amir, we did have a few questions, quite a few, on the um, question panel of the GoToMeeting. So maybe I can read some of those and you can come off mute or stay off mute, I should say, um, and help me answer a few of these. So the first question is, are there workshops you're planning to build around refactor spaces and V function? The answer is yes. Um, as Amir mentioned, that on the V function website, you'll see links to the AWS Migration Hub refactor spaces and V functions demo that we've walked through here today. We also have some uh, workshops available with your AWS account team. Uh, they are able to work with you to bring those um, workshops to, to you um, and make sure that you and your teams have a, a access uh, to those capabilities. So reach out to your account team if you're interested in that as well. The next one, um, is it always useful for cloud native monolithic applications? Um, that's a really big question and very hard to answer specifically. I think we know from working in AWS that it is always a 
a bottleneck remover if you move to AWS first before you attempt to modernize your application. But I think there's so many edge cases around what the application is, where it's positioned in its existing architecture that needs to be answered before we can say, is it always useful uh, to make sure that it is a cloud native monolithic application? I think you can look at your applications and understand whether or not um, they are ripe for modernization and whether or not they fit that profile. If you have questions about that, um, both Amir and I would be happy to answer that. If you wanna reach out directly, we can have a conversation specifically about an application you're interested in as well. Belinda, we... I would maybe add. Sure. Um, it's, it's about the, um, I think it's about the pain. If you're feeling the pain with the application with the diminishing developed engineering velocity, uh, every release takes longer than before, uh, features that you think should be quick or taking a long time, then that is most likely a candidate for this re-architecture and reducing of technical debt. So you should have this feeling uh, if you are kind of overpowered by technical technical debt and you need to. Uh, so you should really, I mean, if you if if your answer is yes, then um, my guess would be that it is a candidate. Sounds good. We have a couple more questions we'll go through here. So the next one is, do we provide tooling to reconcile the results with business users and take deviations into consideration when measuring the refactoring effort? So I think that's a question about the comparison capabilities that vFunction has. Um, I believe I, Amir showed how you can uh, see what has changed between old and new. And I think you can take that forward when you have conversations with your business users and product owners um, from that point forward. I think the next question is uh, using static and runtime code analysis produces bounded context as the legacy developers understood them when domain driven design may not have been used. Does V function provide tooling to reconcile the results with business users? Oh, I just reread the same question. I apologize. Um, so I think we answered that, that, and I think Amir may have demoed that uh, just after the question was posted, but if you wanted a deeper dive, please reach out to us. Um, I'm sharing some contact information here and we'd be happy to go into a deep dive and show you how that can be done. The next question, Amir, I think is for you. Is there a licensing cost for V function? Is it available through AWS Marketplace? So V function is available uh, on the AWS Marketplace, but it is a B, bring your own license. Um, uh, so you can contact us through info at vfunction.com um, and, uh, and we've talked about it. Um, the, the licensing is uh, varies based on the complexity and number of classes in your application. So if it's a, a monolith with over a million lines of code, it's going to be different than 100,000 lines of code, obviously. So just contact us at info at vfunction and we'll be happy to talk about it. Okay, the next question is, does the platform run on any other applications written in languages other than Java or .NET? So at the moment it's Java and .NET. That is um, good news. I will also say that at AWS, we have a couple of other refactoring solutions. Um, in October of last year, we announced that we had acquired uh, Blue, Blue Age and with Blue Age and um, AWS, you can now look to modernize mainframes as well. So if you'd like information on that, uh, make sure you look that up. I, there's a lot of public press announcements about that as well. Uh, can we use HTTPS endpoints? I think that question came as we were uh, talking through refactor spaces at the outset of the call. And the answer to that is yes, we can do both yes. HTTP and HTTPS. Um, I think the last question here is, can you elaborate on how the platform performs the assessment on the monolith code? I think this may have come in before you talked it through, but maybe you can give an overview at a high level what it does when you're looking at the monolith. So think about it as like a, 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 um, an optimization problem. So we take into account all of your uh, all your call stacks, all of the objects that it tracks, and we, we try to come up with a plan that increases, that maximizes the exclusivity, uh, the domain exclusivity, the class exclusivity, the resource exclusivity, and minimizes the constraints. So that's what the AI does, um, really. Uh, and, and then it presents it to the architect, because, of course, the system can only show you so much. I mean, the, 
the system can solve this problem based on how the code is currently written. But the, the way the code is currently written doesn't necessarily mean that that is exactly what your architects intend to do or really want to do, but it is always a really good start. Well, fantastic. I think that's all the questions I had on the list here today. I do want to take some uh, time here to thank Amir for joining us um, and for vFunction for being a partner with us for Refactor Spaces. We're very excited. This is a new service for AWS that we launched in February, and we're ready to hear your feedback, um, as well as to make sure that we have all of the right features to meet your modernization needs going forward. So as you have feedback, please either reach directly out to your account team for a deep dive conversation with us. They have all of our um, hot dial information where they can grab our information and bring us to a conversation. Um, or you can send us feedback directly. You can either go to vfunction at info at vfunction.com or of course directly to Amir at vfunction.com. Or you can reach out to the Refactor Spaces team at AWS, aws-refactorspaces-info at amazon.com. I really appreciate all of your time today. Uh, just for those of you that were able to attend and thought this was incredible information that you wanted to share with your teammates. We will make this recording available um, out on YouTube and we'll send a note out to the attendees and registrants so you have access to that recording information as soon as we've made it available. Thank you all again for your time.